I'd like to introduce you to, uh, to Meryl. Meryl is the research manager at Real, and she's also managing the PCTA project. So I thought Meryl should take this opportunity to talk a little bit more broadly about some of the work that's actually happening within the PCTA project currently. Meryl, over to you. Good morning, colleagues. I'm glad to see such a good turnout that shows there's a real interest in the topic of, that we're discussing today. But we'll take a little bit of a broader step back and talk about the PCTA WITS Real Research Partnership that is in place. Dr. Prisha Ransurup has already introduced herself and she is the chair, the research chair for the partnership. So she is heading up um, the various research projects. The first project that has already been completed is e developing an e-learning framework for use in the public service sector. And I think in a future session, you will hear more about all of our projects. The second stream of work relates to looking at jobs, occupations, and qualifications, and the relationship with them and how they play out in practice in the public service sector. The third stream of work is looking at the sustainable development goals, in particular 4.3, which looks at affordable and accessible education, essentially in the post-school sector, and what kind of capacity is needed from a state perspective to deliver on that SDG. And then the fifth stream of work looks at the topic of critically reviewing both skills demand and supply processes in the public service sector. And of course, all of this work is aimed at the broader objective of how skills development can support a capable, ethical, competent state to deliver on its mandate. The next seminar we will hold in November, and you will get details shortly, will be looking at the critical review of skills, demand and supply processes in our public service sector. And all of the projects are aimed at ultimately improving these with maximum input of stakeholders. Thank you so much, Meryl, for that broad overview of the entire project. And uh, now that you all have uh, attended this uh, particular seminar, you will get invites to the rest of the PC to Real uh, seminar series that will be on the go. Uh, so the next one in November is, I'm not really sure of the date, but I'm sure. 17th of November, I'm told. So the 17th of November. So with that, um, Kate has already introduced Dr. Sedebe. So I'm going to hand over to Dr. Sedebe and a huge welcome and thank you again. Over to you. Good morning, uh, program director and uh, members present. I hope it's okay that I should proceed to present without you seeing my face. Program director. Yes, that's fine. Thank you very much. Uh, Kate, uh, if we can proceed to the next slide. Okay, so I'm just going to cover uh, three items, uh, the introduction, the context, and inter-organizational leadership uh, competences. If we proceed to uh, the next slide, by way of introduction, I just want to indicate that um, it's clear that I did this uh, for my PhD, but uh, I have tried to update uh, the context. My starting point is uh, by default or design, the South African public service sector comprises of more than 250 state institutions, and these are national and provincial departments, but it excludes national and provincial state-owned entities or enterprises and local government institutions. Uh, this therefore makes uh, what we call the public service the largest single employer in the country. Uh, Obviously, we know that the mandate of the uh, public service, uh, all of the institutions that constitute uh, what we call the public service is derived from the Constitution of the Republic. And uh, that mandate is elaborated in hundreds 
pieces of legislation and regulations. This therefore makes the public service extremely complex and uh, the delivery of this mandate is dependent on the existence, the coordination and the integration of systems, structures, tools, processes and procedures, financial resources, human resources or capacity and many other visible and invisible drivers of performance at the individual team intra intra organizational level as well as sectoral uh, uh, levels um, i think the context within which the public service operates currently like i've indicated it is characterized by the overlapping authority models which we can see them through the existence of the igr structures hybrid organizational structures as we still have our departments we have clusters we have intersectoral clusters and other mechanisms that have been put in place that coexist alongside the original bureaucracy. And obviously there is the unavoidable need for collaborative public management, multifaceted forms of accountability, as well as distributed, integrative and collective forms of leadership that transcend but do not exclude individual capabilities, formal authority and hierarchy. The last statement, I just want to indicate that it is important, but if you place too much emphasis on it, it does not work in the governance era. This therefore requires a different and incremental leadership model that is characterized by different and enhanced leadership mindsets, knowledge, skills, behaviors, abilities, and continuously evolving organizational meta capabilities. And all of this have got implications for individual, intra and inter organizational leadership competences, as well as competency leadership development and frameworks. And this applies not just to the public sector, but also to the private sector. Um, it is within that particular context uh, that in my study, I specifically looked at the required competences for interorganizational leadership because the view is interorganizational leadership is no longer a preference or a desirable. It is an absolute necessity. And uh, this does not just apply to South Africa, but internationally. Uh, in different types of countries and also in private sector organizations that operate across geographic boundaries. And through the study and obviously using the literature and engaging with current and former directors general who served for many years in the governance and administration cluster, which was my case study, um, a list of 23 competences were identified. It's an inventory, as you can see, but I just want to indicate that the importance of intra-organizational team leadership and collaborative leadership is absolutely important for people who find themselves operating in the IGR space or in the inter-organizational or collaborative space and the type of leadership that happens at an institutional level tends to replicate itself in these uh, boundaryless uh, uh, structures. So some of the competences that were listed, as you can see, they comprise of what anybody would say, I have seen this in different inventories, whether we are talking about stakeholder management, mediation and conflict uh, resolution, flexibility and adaptability, creativity and innovation, foresight, communication, interpersonal skills, and so forth. But obviously the importance of emotional intelligence and continuous learning, it might be seen as something that is done to people or that people do for themselves, but it is continuous learning is a competence on its own and it is a competency requirement for people who operate in a continuously evolving environment. And the other competency area that I just want to highlight, which is often taken for granted when we talk about leadership, 
is technical expertise or domain area expertise. The assumption that is often made is you can take anybody from anywhere if they are a so-called good manager or good leader and they will still be good in those en environments. And literature and experience has proven that this is not the case. If we can proceed to the next slide, I'm not going to read out the entire competency list. Um, there was a whole process of analyzing the inventory using literature, using information that came from uh, the participants who were interviewed as well as those who completed the questionnaires. And in the end, the 23 competency list were grouped into three skills domains, the cognitive, the social, the technical, as well as what I referred to as the cross-cutting values. And you can see just from the table here that certain skills or competences apply, they featured in the different uh, skills domains. Uh, for an example, when you're looking at technical expertise, it would go under the technical, it would also go into the cognitive. The reason why this happened is literature and participants repeatedly alluded to the fact that competences are not, you can no longer treat competences uh, in an isolated manner, they are interdependent. Some competences are foundational to others and others have an interrelated relationship in the sense that one competency, if it is developed, it has to be developed alongside a number of competences or the ability of persons and groups to exercise particular competency domains. They use multiple competences at the same time. Those are integrated um, in a sophisticated manner that allows those people to deal with complex environments, informations, and so forth. Then if you proceed to the next slide, another process was engaged to look at how do we deal with these uh, groups of competencies because in reality, we know that shopping lists of competences are not very easy to work with. It's always better to have a small uh, set. But because of the interrelated nature of these competences, eventually the competences were grouped into what I have referred to as the competency clusters. And the foundational competences related to what I referred to as the cross-cutting values. And that competency cluster was therefore named a values orientation competency. Um, if you read literature in public administration, um, not just in the current era, I think for the past 30 years, if not more, the role of values in particular context is important. And I think in our South African context, when we look at our constitution, and the different types of white papers and frameworks that uh, uh, were developed. They have implications for the type of leadership competency and a value system that is required. And, and hence, this is important, but also literature from other parts of the world continues to play emphasis on the importance of values. The second competency cluster it was loosely referred to as disciplined agile behavior. It sounds contradictory, but in the governance era, where we require the existence of social regulation structures, we require processes and procedures that ensure consistency across the board. It is important for those who are in leadership positions to have the required levels of discipline to abide by the law, to follow the prescripts, but equally they need to be agile in a sense that 
when some of the prescripts are standing on the way of development, they have to be very quick to identify that and make the necessary adaptations instead of simply disregarding the frameworks that they need to be operating within. And therefore, this is what I've referred to as disciplined agile behavior. But it is equally the sort of competency that says it applies to the person, you apply it to yourself before you can expect to apply it in an interactive environment with other people. The third cluster was referred to as dynamic interactions and communication. Deliberately so, because leadership in the governance era, it is not a trait of the heroic leader or the individual who sits in a particular position or holds a title. It is a give and take. Firstly, it is a give and take between the mind and the heart of the person in their isolated space. It is a give and take between a person and other persons they interact with. It is a give and take between organizations and units. Please go back to the previous slide. I will conclude at <laughs> contrary. So the issue of dynamic interactions and communication should not be seen as at an individual level, but it is also a type of competency that characterizes the image and the wisdom and the totality of institutions and how they are experienced by other people in the broader public. The third foundational cluster I've referred to loosely as expansive intra-organizational knowledge and skills. And this is the area that deals with technical expertise. It's a combination of the knowledge, the skills and the experience that when a person participates in inter-organizational structures, they do not represent themselves, nor do they represent their competency level. They represent the collective wisdom of their institution. And how they develop that collective wisdom is a matter that needs to be addressed through the competency frameworks. Then there were core cognitive and boundary spanning knowledge and experience. And uh, the cognitive one, this is where a lot of the integration happens within a person before the integration can even happen between persons. Strategic and systems thinking, creativity, foresight, innovation, visioning, problem solving, and others. A leader in the public sector currently where you're not just running a singular institution or unit in isolation from the rest. They require that type of cognitive complexity. A lot is demanded out of them. And yes, it is understandable. There will be limits. And hence, through the dynamic interaction and communications, persons or people and institutions are able to have a feedback mechanism that enables the exchange and the development of cognitive complexity at an individual and institutional level. The last one was the boundary spanning knowledge and experience. And this basically says, in the public service, it is not good enough to know what your institution is responsible for or what is expected from your institution. You also have to know what the stakeholders out there expect, what they want and how they respond. And it, it, it's a lot more. And hence the importance earlier on that was referred to, to continuous learning as a critical competency skill for public sector leaders. You cannot have boundary spanning knowledge and experience if you do not have the desire and the will to continuously push your boundaries through learning. Then when we proceed to the next slide, this is largely how the competences uh, uh, in this document were, were, were developed. And you can see what the study emphasized is the competency clusters on their own. 
knowing them, being able to list them or to list their sub-level behavioral traits and others is not a guarantee that a person is competent. So those competency clusters on their own, they do not constitute individual and collective leadership competence in the public service. They merely represent the individual and compositional aggregate static competences. And by that, I am referring to existing and prior competences that people and institutions bring into an inter-organizational structure or an IGR structure or any structure that requires people to move outside of their boundaries. What is required to convert those static competencies, assuming that they are in existence, is appropriate dynamics, the group dynamics, institutional dynamics. It's the social regulation structures. It is the feedback mechanisms. And these, they need to transcend managerial positions, titles, ranks, and organizational or sectoral boundaries. It is only when these are in existence that we are able to convert static competences that can be learned, and some of them are innate, into dynamic competences. Knowing or identifying a list of competences is not a guarantee that uh, people will be competent. And when people are competent at their individual level and they come together, that does not make the collective competent. It simply means they are all bringing in their aesthetic competencies and that is not good enough to make the public service effective in a rapidly changing environment. What is required are the appropriate group dynamics, uh, social regulation structures, and the feedback mechanisms that would convert the static competencies that bring people bring into any setting into dynamic uh, uh, competencies. And that is the area where competency frameworks and competency development comes in uh, at the individual, organizational, and intersectoral uh, 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 levels. Uh, so let me stop at that. Okay, thanks colleagues. Um, we are now gonna move into a Q&A. Dr. Sedeba, I hope you can hear us, but uh, the Q&A, we already have uh, one question for you. So I will field the questions as they come in. Uh, the first question was, can you kindly confirm whether you have looked at the current competency framework for senior management uh, services? And I assume that the speaker is trying to ask a question about what your impression of the senior management service competency framework is. The second question is actually asking the kind of competencies that your research work has actually surfaced and brought up. Is there an attempt or how are you going to engage with the current senior management compet uh, services competency frameworks? Is there going or are you engaging in any processes to integrate some of the learnings from the study into the current competency frameworks? So over to you. The problem statement for, for my study was precisely that um, the the existing competency framework for senior managers in the public service is not adequate to enable the public service or the cluster system to be effective because it is designed and developed for purposes of dealing with um, senior managers at an individual level and to a degree senior managers at an intra-organizational level. And the framework, again, it has limitations in the sense that some of the competency lists identified are not necessarily addressed for a start. Our competency framework does not deal with technical or domain level expertise, it is assumed. 
that this will be done at a institutional level by different institutions. Um, it was largely from that problem statement that I then uh, undertook uh, the study to look at why has the cluster system using the GNA as a case study has not been that effective or has not been effective as reported in the number of evaluation reports that were commissioned by government itself, uh, DPME and the presidency. Uh, so yes, um, I did have a look at it. I, I deal with it extensively uh, on the basis of the inputs from uh, the candidates who participated themselves as well as available published literature from government and academia. Uh, are there any plans uh, to use the outcome of the study to <laughs> influence the competency framework? Uh, I think I need to be honest here and say <laughs> for a start, when you do a PhD, uh, you do it because you want to complete your PhD, but secondly, you hope to make a contribution in the area of work where you're operating or in a particular practice. Um, I have not necessarily uh, made an attempt to share the study. I have brought it to the attention of those who participated. Some are still in government to say here is the study. If I am given the opportunity to present, I will present, but I think the review of uh, the competency framework, the existing one for senior managers is the responsibility of the DPSA. But I just also want to caution that the proposed competences from my thesis are not meant or the framework that I have proposed, including the principles for inter-organizational leadership, which uh, serve as the social regulation structures to enable the dynamic interactions that I was referring to, is not meant to replace uh, intra-organizational or individual competency frameworks. Um, good morning. Um, I wanted Sidiba to um, maybe respond, but um, I, I, my position is in a, um, well, I was a, a teacher educator and have been working in training of teachers for many, many years. And everybody will remember that about 20 years ago, the curriculum introduced outcomes and we all struggled to translate outcomes into qualifications and more so into curriculum programs. And I'm wondering why we're coming back to this, although we call it competencies, but everybody can see that it's very similar. And how are we gonna overcome that? Because competencies in themselves cannot guide us in what we need to train and what we need to put into, into the training. At the end, you don't learn competency. Competency is a result of learning something else. And the something else is bodies of knowledge of sort. So this is something that I put on the table. I, I see Sidiba is not here and maybe we can all think about it because it's coming back into the vocationalizing of curriculum in schools. It, the questions of competency is everywhere. It's not only in the public sector. It's now back into uh, basic education. And, and I keep thinking, why have we not learn, learned from what all the debate that we had on curriculum in the 90s when outcome-based was introduced? Okay, thank you, Yael, uh, for that insight. From an educational perspective, what exactly can qualifications offer in terms of the guidance of designing thinking about educational preparation for the world of work. Can it actually guide the curriculum? Can it actually guide what it is that a person is required to know and be able to do in the world of work? And we're always raising those kind of questions. Uh, Siba? My question was, how do we improve if they are not adequate and how do we eventually utilize them for SMS senior management in the public sector from level 13 up until level 16, because we are currently using them, uh, is the intention of the study to, to edify or to improve 
or our current competency or what? Because I'm not clear. I, I understand that she's saying there's a limitations, but I would have I would have loved to uh, to indicate whether there will be improvement uh, or what was going to be done with the current one if she has realized that I'm, I'm, I'm not adequate. Yes, thank you for that question, uh, Lesiba. Uh, I was wondering if anyone, if there was anyone from DPSA on the call who would actually like to uh, respond to that question, because I think, you know, we're in a sort of position to say, we are we're looking for good research on the topic, which is why we met her and engaged with, with, uh, with the work that she was doing at the University of Pretoria and the, that community of, of, of scholars. But our... I guess the same question could be applied to the real research program. How will public sector, uh, people that drive change in the public sector actually use what's coming out of research? So it would be very interesting if there is someone from the PSA to give us a, some kind of feedback or, 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 or give us some insights into this. Uh, le let me quickly say in terms of responding to Yael, um, I, I understand uh, somebody in the background is talking. Um, the, the concern that she is raising is that competencies themselves do not tell us or do not guide us on what we must train people on one of the competencies or two of those competencies that I have alluded to, one deals with um, expansive intra-organizational uh, 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 competence, uh, which means that is where the knowledge uh, that is required at that level, the domain level expertise uh, 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 that is required. And uh, those domain level uh, uh, competences, they need to be specified for what is required in a particular context. And in terms of the uh, um, a boundary spanning type of knowledge, again, this, uh, Francine, uh, this uh, needs to be spelled out. I think in my thesis, I have given examples of some of the issues that people alluded to. Um, the other competencies, they are really processing, they are competencies that people use to process knowledge, to process what they observe in the environment, to process how they react uh, uh, to, 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 to environments and so forth. So from my perspective, uh, competencies and competency frameworks are not an equivalent of outcomes-based education. It might be that in outcomes-based education, one of the things that we were looking at was the enhanced competences of people in particular areas, subject domains, in their abilities to deliver and so forth. But competencies are not necessarily um, equivalent to outcomes-based uh, education because the notion of competency framework applies in so many domains. In so many domains where you need to be training people, you need to know what are you training people for, for what and why. And you need to fill in the gap in terms of the content that is required. And that is how competency frameworks are developed. They don't come from anywhere else. And in my study, you will see that I have given a critique of how often competency framework development creates problems when we simply take what we find on the internet or from a certain institution that we think is doing very well to the neglect of our own context. And, and this is the reason why I have made reference to our constitution and so many pieces of legislation and frameworks that says what is the mandate of government and what must it deliver and all of that contextual information including the challenges that we are experiencing and the expectations of our communities should begin to allow us to articulate what are the competences that we need from public servants so that they are able to deal with all of these issues and um, the emphasis, again, that I have placed on the evolving nature of competence and competency frameworks. Any framework that would have been developed and it was deemed to be perfect before COVID, I am sure uh, if people were to go back, they will realize that there are gaps. 
and, 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 and how often can you review the competency frameworks? It is not something that I can say, uh, do it every two to three years. But at the end of the day, the argument that I was trying to arrive at is where people are able to do things coll collectively and collaboratively, the opportunities for cross-learning increases and the competencies that people bring into that context are enhanced. But if you do not have an understanding of how those conversion processes work, the nature of competency development is also not going to assist because you put people in a classroom, they go back to an environment that prohibits them from doing anything differently that is required to get them to become agile. Uh, in terms of Lisiba, uh, I, I, again, um, I will share my study. I think I have shared it with people at DPSA. Uh, I have shared it with people who are members of the GNA cluster. I have made whatever claims that I have made to say the framework might have been based on the experiences of what was called the GNA cluster. We now have a very differently named cluster with a different mandate and certain expectations. And maybe it is the principles that I, I outline in the thesis that can give people an idea of how do you make collective, collaborative uh, uh, leadership possible in a very complex environment and you make it possible in a manner that allows people themselves to adapt that allows the institutions to adapt without waiting for anybody to amend a framework. Uh, I, I think th those would be a little bit uh, uh, of my responses. They might not be adequate, uh, but yes, I, I do not have the responsibility. And I think anybody who studies, um, you hope that your, 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 the outcome of your study will be used to improve that which you saw as a problem, but you cannot impose it on the institution. Uh, so I, I would um, advise Lisiba maybe to read uh, in my thesis. I think it is available when you, you do a search uh, and it is downloadable from the UP website and you will see the angle from which I have come from and some of the issues that I have tried to allude to as to why, why is the existing SMS competency framework limited but equally I did not say throw it away. I said you can use the outcome of my thesis to strengthen it, but to go beyond the framework so that you begin to address competences outside of the institutions, which is what the framework is dealing with, competency at a departmental level and at a personal level. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for that response, Adebe. Uh, Francine de Clark. Francine, do you want to come in? Yes, thank you, Presha. I think I want to follow up on what uh, Kurufelo uh, has just mentioned, and that is um, in, in, in Lisiba as well. We have to ask a serious question about what competency framework can and cannot do, which in fact uh, Presha just uh, mentioned at the beginning of the seminar, in order to answer whether you know, Kurufelo's um, findings can be taken up and adapted to the public service to make it more efficient. We need to ask serious question about what kind of public service have we got? What is the leadership of that public service about? Are they keen to indeed use the competency framework to um, promote professionalization? Because that's really what it's about. So we need to ask those questions and you know, we, we can have many policy documents that incorporate what Corofello has said or even what we're going to find, but if they're not going to be enacted by a leadership that is committed and has the will to make the best of this competency framework in a dynamic environment, it's not going to happen. And as we know, South Africa is uh, always being praised for the policy document uh, and policy that they have developed, but implementation is often uh, wanting. So I just want to, to, to in a way, re-emphasize the limitation, which I think both uh, Kurufelo and Lesiba have mentioned. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Francine, uh, for that comment. Uh, Tolika, uh, who is... Um, from the real center as well, Tolika. 
No, thanks, thanks, Prisha. Thank you so much, Doc, for, for this presentation. It was mind uh, stimulating. You, you mentioned at the beginning a very interesting point, uh, which I wanted to, to ask you. Now, you say local government and SOEs are not part of the public service. I'm interested to know why, because some of us would think that uh, local government SOEs are part of the state institutions. And uh, in, your, in your presentation, you said, no, they are excluded. That's the one question. Probably the last question uh, in the interest of time. I mean, if you, if you read chapter, chapter 13 of the, the National Development Plan, it talks about building an efficient and strong, capable state. Uh, and, and, and it talks about some of the weaknesses of, in, in our state. And amongst others would be the lack of uh, this adept uh, skilled personnel to drive uh, both social and economic transformation. And in your presentation, you make a point that knowing and having these various or different uh, competencies is not a guarantee and is not good enough for public service. It's not adequate to have a service, a public service that is proficient. And my question is, then what would it take for us as a nation to have this internal coherent and strong and capable public service if the, the individual skills uh, are not necessary enough to contribute in building this developmental state as imagined by chapter 13 of the NDP? Thanks. Okay, um, thanks. Uh, Program director, I think I prefaced that very point by saying by design or default. Uh, the public service sector, and I'm saying public service as we call it, it excludes local government and, and the public service. It is how the Public Service Act um, has articulated what is referred to as the public service. It has excluded local government. Uh, institutions that are regarded as the public service in the South African context are those that are listed in Schedule 1 to 3 of the Public Service Act. And the state-owned entities are not there, nor is it local government. And we do know uh, about the debates and um, uh, 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 disagreements about whether national and provincial government, uh, uh, um, you know, let's say the single public service issue that did not succeed because of the so-called independence of local government. Uh, but again, uh, our state-owned entities, uh, to a greater degree, they are managed and regulated using different sets of rules as opposed to the rules that are used uh, in the national and provincial government. So these are basically the reasons, and that is why I said by default or by design, it is different from other countries where they will talk about a civil service that includes a, a large number of institutions and not necessarily limiting them to the core departments and government components as we refer them in the public service. It is what it is. I think it has been accepted as a norm. I work for an institution public service that we are told we do not have a mandate over state-owned entities and local government because of the adopted definition of public service from the Public Service Act. So, yeah, so then you, you can decide whether that definition is helping or it is not helping. And that is why I simply said by design or by default, this is the, the status quo. Thanks. Thank you, Sudeba. Sudeba, there is an interesting question uh, that, is, that is in the chat that is looking at how do we make judgments and assess these competencies? So I don't know in, in the work that you've done, if you've uh, come across any insights around this. There are two related questions around how do we make these kind of judgments around people's competencies and how do we assess competencies? As I indicated earlier, how you formulate your competency framework, the context and everything else, has major implications for the competency development programs that you would put in place. And equally, it has implications 
for how you assess. Um, stipulating a competency in a manner in which I have done, which is called the competency cluster, it's vague. It's a very nice thing that makes you remember what you're looking for. But when you start unpacking what constitutes that competency, how did you arrive at the, 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 the subsets of that competency? And what are the behavioral uh, 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 traits that you look for? What are the actions and, and, and all that? Because they, they are skills. There has to be demonstrated skills. And all of that, you have to be able to articulate all of those in a competency framework. Because in the absence of that articulation, then uh, the judgment of a competency framework then becomes a subjective uh, uh, exercise and it doesn't add value. But to a greater degree, how do you develop your competency framework? Um, there are many ways, I think people will say benchmarking and all that and, and, and all that, but uh, one of the very original methods that was used uh, in the initial stages of the competency movement was what is called the behavioral uh, event, um, behavioral interview, um, BEI, behavioral event interview where the starting point would be to look at those people that people says, how come this person everywhere they go, they are able to make a positive change that makes those people who expect a particular service from that institution to be happy. How possible is it that a particular institution under the leadership of particular persons and, and, and so forth they are able to deliver on the mandate in a manner that is not just satisfying to those people who say we've done it, but it is also to everyone else who is looking. And that process therefore requires that you engage with those people and they need to be able to explain to you how they do it. Then you need to take it to the rest of the other people. It's an extremely laborious process. And that is why the BEI is generally not done in the development of competency frameworks. We are very quick to go for benchmarking off the shelf type of thing. And then you talk to one or two people and at worst, uh, it's possibly a Kulu fellow, the first and the second and the third sitting behind their desk. They do a little bit of slap dash research. And then we, we produce a competency framework and we say, here it is. We have not even spoken to a, a, a different stakeholders. We have not even spoken to the people who are charged with the responsibility of delivering on the mandate of government. So the how you develop the competency and what you put in it right through up to the end, to the extent that it makes it possible for even an individual person when they are sitting in a corner to say, I aspire to be a senior manager, or I aspire to be a middle manager, or I aspire to be the president, what must I do? You can go to the framework and it will tell you, we want a person who will be able to demonstrate the following competences and how do we know they have just demonstrated it? So to a greater degree, the South African Competency Framework does outline those uh, particular issues in spite of its limitation. And I think a lot of competency frameworks would go to the extent of outlining the behavioral indicators and everything else. But whether the competencies that are in those frameworks are themselves aligned or relevant to the context and the mandate and everything else that is going on, it's a big question mark. Whether there are systems and processes that are put in place to make sure that those who are found to be deficient in those competences are developed, it's another big question mark. So like Francine said, competency frameworks do not solve all problems. They play a role where they play a role. It is the same as people who are highly competent when they come into institutions that don't have systems, structures, and everything else, and there are no resources to put those things in place, their competence is not going to result in the effectiveness that you're looking for. So competency frameworks and leadership competence, let me put it that way, it's one element of a complexity of so many things, some of them we can see them, some of them we can't. The same applies with organizational culture. It's very important. And, and hence, I made reference to 
there are other visible and invisible environmental factors that contribute towards public service uh, effectiveness. And somebody needs to be able to deal with those issues. And by talking to the public servants themselves, starting from our street level bureaucrats who are saving people at home affairs and, and so forth, it's, it's not about the DG or the EA, talking to different stakeholders in society, that is what will make it possible for us to articulate all of those things that would make the framework relevant for the context that would make the framework useful for the development of a, a competency a development programs. And it would also make it possible for us to use those frameworks to evaluate. Uh, so there's a lot more work that needs to be done at the beginning before a framework can begin to, to serve the purpose for which you want it to serve. But that framework must also find itself in a context and systems and processes that are ready to work with it. Uh, for an example, in the thesis, I allude to the fact that um, you would have a, a competency framework that says, um, and, and starting from reading the constitution, we want uh, uh, leaders who are ethical, leaders who promote participatory governance and all of those, but, when the environment is such that in the systems, uh, whether we are talking about the budgeting systems, I give you a budget as DGX. Uh, so this is what results in people not even engaging in collective leadership, even with the people who work with them in their little institutions, let alone at a cluster level. They worry about themselves because I'm accountable for this budget alone. I'm going to be assessed alone. I'm going to be fired alone. So there is a range of other systems that must also make it possible for a particular type of competency framework to, to add value. And if the context is not ready, that competency framework will not make a difference. Thanks. Thank you so much for that, Sedebe. Uh, um, our next question is uh, Stephanie Ale, who is also uh, at the Real Center. Stephanie holds a Saatchi chair in skills development. Steph, over to you. It won't let me turn my video on. I don't know why. But anyway, I'll speak with, with just my picture. I prefer to have probably a video. Probably knows you didn't comb your hair. <laughs> I definitely did. Um, yeah, I just think that this is a really, really fascinating debate. And I guess one of the biggest problems that that confronts so the South African government is, where do we start? Um, so this very, very interesting study, and I think that, you know, Kulufela has made the point really clearly that this isn't enough, and um, individuals may be competent, but their competence may be invisible if they're in the wrong system. Um, Yael has foregrounded um, that it is impossible to design a curriculum backwards from competencies. And I think that that is a really profound and important insight that comes from educational research, that people who haven't engaged with that educational research really need to engage with and take seriously. There is a wealth of educational research which says, you can't start by saying, these are the things that we want people to be able to do. Now let's design backwards from that. It's much more complicated than that to think about what are the bodies of knowledge, skill, expertise, skillful practice, tacit knowledge, theoretical knowledge that are required to do certain particular jobs. And, and they are required through formal education as well as through, through on the job study. So, um, and we also, you know, the debate is also foregrounded that it's not straightforward to measure. So in other words, that means it has limitations as a performance management tool, particularly in a context, and I think Kulafella made this in her last um, intervention, in a context in which there's a bunch of other performance measurements that people are being assessed against. So I guess what really, what really this puts on the table for all of us who are trying to think about this issue is, why do we think this is a useful starting point? Or another way of putting that is, to what extent is it and could it be a useful starting point? Um, you know, I think 
we can have a lot of debate about what are the right competencies and should we have this competency or that competency and should they be clustered and how can they be clustered? But, you know, all of us who have used home affairs services, which I assume is all of us South Africans on the call, um, can firstly say quite clearly what we want and secondly can say quite clearly that in most cases what we have got is very far from what we want. So how does having a competency framework assist? Is it the right entry point into thinking about the very, very serious problems that we have in our public service? I think that's what I would, would really want to table for all of us to discuss. Thank, thank you, Stephanie. There's some important considerations and points there. I'm going to ask uh, Zanele to come in. Zanele Kube, Kube, Kubisa from the... Uh, LG Sita, Zanele, you have, you've had your hand up for a while. Do you want to come in and then I'll uh, pass back to Colofelo. Zanele. Thank you, Prisha. I'm also from the real school because, you know, I'm not done. But thank you so much for that. So, um, yes, I'm from the local government, Sita. And I just want to say to, to Dr. Sidiba, thank you for my, so much for this research. Because I think in the past two years in this organization, we conducted a study on the competencies of the senior managers in the local government sector. And one of the recommendations was that uh, although the local government sector has correctly emphasized selected occupation specific Tec technical competences, more should be done to develop intangible competences, such as uh, cognitive conceptual judgment, your emotional intelligence. And she touched on the um, cognitive uh, domain. And I think uh, that will really help us to actually, you know, take the study forward and, 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 and identify the uh, intangible competences that the, the study is saying we need to, you know, to, to actually identify. So for me, Prisha, it's just to say thank you to Dr. Sidibe and um, I would love to read her entire paper and, and, and actually improve um, the work that we're doing in the local government sector to, to identify the competencies that are needed by our senior manage, managers. Um, in the local government sector. So thank you so much, Prisha. Thank you, Zanele. Colofelo, um, do you want to come in? And uh, those were two comments, but I don't know if you have any last comments from you. And then I'm going to hand over to Kate and Francine. Colofelo? Uh, thanks uh, very much. Um, I may not have answers to the questions raised by Stephanie. Where do we start? Why do we think competency frameworks or even competency lists uh, um, are a good starting point? Let me respond by saying that it is, it is not debatable, it's, it's actually accepted that competency frameworks are not a panacea for all organizational performance and public service delivery challenges. They have strengths, they have weaknesses, it's important to understand that. So when you use them, you need to take that into account and use them for that which you are able to. And I think I have tried to allude to that, I have also outlined the potential strengths and the weaknesses of the competency framework that I have outlined as I have done for the weaknesses and the strengths of the existing competency framework or any other framework that is looking into a smaller domain. The last thing that I just want to comment on is to say one of the things that makes it very difficult to develop uh, competences uh, to identify competences, to develop them, and so forth. I think for a start, competences, competency lists are constructed by humans. You can see how I played around with things based on what I thought was related. Uh, but yes, there are certain competency lists that uh, would be considered to be, or oh, it's a given, don't question it, everybody has accepted it. But how you look at the interdependencies and the relationships 
to say, I cannot be saying I'm developing a person in that area and excluding that because that requires that to, to work. It's a much more complex environment. Because I have used complexity leadership theory in my study, one of the most important points made in complexity leadership theory is that people who have been found to be adaptive and agile in different work environments, they themselves often are unable to explain how they do that. And this takes me back to the point that I made about the behavioral event interview methodology. It is in that process that one tries to unpack how you did this, why you did it that way, that you are then able, especially when you outline the indicators for particular competence, uh, 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 to explain those issues. So these are the realities of what we are dealing with uh, uh, when it comes to competency framework because competence, it is something that we often judge in the outside, but we do not know what really goes on in the heads and the minds and the hearts of the people that make them do things in a manner that results in a competence that we see in the outside. And maybe these are the areas where one would expect that in the public service domain, we need to be working very closely with the educational background and the psychologists and people who are now dealing with things relating to neuroscience and all of that. But in the absence of understanding that which it is not seen, we will always articulate competency frameworks based on what people tell us they think or they feel and based on what we observe and we think we are describing it properly. But there is actually much more that goes on in the domains that we do not see. And I think the co cognitive complexity part tries to explain that it is much more complex. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. I think that uh, kind of brings together a lot and uh, gives us some useful points to take forward into discussion. So I'm going to hand it over now to uh, to Kate Colofello. Thank you so much. I'm going to hand you over to to Kate. Kate, over to you. Um, I think the last part of the discussion has has sort of like been leading to this question that we want to ask everyone. What, what is understood by competencies? I know that a lot of people in the platform, you guys work for, um, you, you work for government, you work for universities, you work for private institutions, and we just want to interact with everyone on the platform to find out um, what is understood by competencies? I think just bringing everything together, what we getting is that competencies are broadly defined. Uh, but the question is, they range from individual to organizational, but how do we assess them? You know, how do you measure a competency? Uh, who is responsible for measuring competencies? And these are the kinds of questions that we are asking, you know, in this research that we, we 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 putting together because uh, there are four positions from research tells us that there are four positions that can be taken in terms of defining competencies and these can be from a personal to a professional level it can also they are also affected by the organizational <laughs> structure of how the organization is, is structured and they also um they can either be constrained and enabled by the different conditions, the relationships we have in our organizations. So because of all of these factors that affect competencies, what, what is it that we as organizations are looking for when we say, what, why do we use competency frameworks? So I'm gonna just open up the platform for anybody who wants to comment. So if you have, based on your own capacity, you know, have you used competency frameworks? How have you used these competency frameworks? So I'm going to take hands or comments. Yeah, look, we are using them uh, within the DPSA currently for, for 11 competencies for senior management that uh, I asked earlier. We are using them. 
We're using them for two, 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 two phases now. We're using them in the interview when, when, when we are looking for, for a, a, a suitable candidate. They, they are writing what we call competency assessment as part of the requirement. And if deemed uh, deficient on, on that and they're already appointed, they have to undergo a, a, a training within 18 months to close the cap of that deficiency. For instance, if it's people management, they need to go for a course of people management. If it's financial management, they need to go for the course of that. If it's a project management, or program management and to go for such kind of course. So in a nutshell, they are helping us uh, to, to, to achieve uh, the, the service delivery imperatives. Um, I, have, I have taken note that they are not adequate. We'll discuss internally here how, how do we then maybe invite Dr. Sidibe to come and, and address us. Uh, that will be the decision of the senior management, but uh, they are useful. Uh, we are using them. And so far, they've been effective. Uh, the only challenge is below SMS, that is from salary level uh, 2 to 12. Well, we are in a process of developing the, the, the framework. So that's where the challenge is. Uh, but for SMS, we are OK. We, we, we are using them. And, and I want to say they are effective so far. Uh, let me leave it there, Chair. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lisiba. Just to clarify, well, when Lisiba talks about the SMS, what he actually means is the Senior Management Competency Framework, for those who don't know. There's the Senior Management okay. Competency Framework, there's the Middle Management Competency Framework, and as well as the Finance Competency Framework and the Monitoring and Evaluation Competency Framework. And these uh, these are the four competency frameworks we are assessing, and they are used in the public uh, in the public sector. Uh, the competencies and the frameworks are can be used in a more generic way, and uh, they are not uh, te technical. So, in the frameworks, they do state that local governments are supposed to develop their own technical computer frameworks at lower level. So if, if there's anybody at, in the platform who works for a local, um, local government, if, if you can also just educate us in terms of how do you use the, 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 the at lower level, how, how, what goes into developing your own competency frameworks? What are some of the challenges that you are facing? Are you using I, are you using them at a more generic, uh, general level or more occupational or technical level? So if I can just read a Lucky's comment that he placed in the Q&A, he said that in his view, Kate, the term competence is complex. To even define it in a set, to even attempt to define it. Looking at some structures that may exist, we may define a person who is able to complete their respective tasks within set time frames without measuring the resources used to achieve the task. A person may be deemed incompetent in task execution, which may have been caused by a lack of provision of resources. So he's adding complexity into the idea of how we frame idea of competent. Okay, Stephanie is also raising the issue around how is effectiveness judged? Yes, Lucky, I think again, you, you're raising a very good issue, which I think is also being partly answered by Kolofelo. Um, when you have a public administration, remember, I, I, I'm just talking about looking at the kind of public service we have. If it's very hierarchical, if people in the unit depend on their superior to mobilize the resource and give them the go ahead, they will face all those, com those, those circumstances that are beyond their control in order to be efficient and do what they're supposed to do. So, and I think uh, what Kurufelo is raising is that we need a public service that is giving a lot more independence and, and autonomy to the units in order to do what they're supposed to do. If they depend on a hierarchy and that that hierarchy will supply or not supply the resources, depending on budget issue and other things, then you're right. You can't judge an individual competency because it's an organizational matter. 
So I think that's the one point. The thing about Stephanie, and Stephanie is really trying to, she's looking at um, the competence framework in terms of a performance management um, tool. And I think what people in the chat, including Kevin and other people are saying is that the competency framework is, and, and Colofello by the way, is there to, to improve the value chain within, within the uh, human resource uh, management system. So it's not just about looking at somebody's performance, it's looking at how to recruit somebody, how to assess somebody for training and upskilling, and then to appraise and maybe to reward eventually. So we're talking about the whole HR value chain. So that's what it's about. And that is why I was mentioning that the competency framework, even though it has limitation, is there to professionalize this, the public service to, from the recruitment side, all the way to career pathing and performance management. But the question of Stephanie is still correct is that we, at the end of the day, we have to see whether the competency framework, organization competency framework improve the delivery. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Francine. Kate, back to you. So on that note, Francine, I think we can move to the second part of, to question number two. We had prepared three questions that we are gonna engage you on. So the second question, Francine. Yes, I mean, I, I want you to um, continue in a way uh, uh, from talking about how we define and assess competency at many different level to a step backwards, which is, but what is the purpose and aim? And I think I just touched on it because I mentioned that I think one of the major kind of innovation about it is to improve the HR value chain. And that's why it's not just a performance management tool like it used to be in the past. Um, so we interviewed a few HR people who are saying, you know, in the past, our uh, activity were mainly transactional. And now we would like it to be more strategic because we want to improve the uh, kind of people we have and uh, how we can uh, you know, push them in the career pathways and uh, improve their seniority and, and, and their performance and the end. So my point is that when you look at the purpose, we can see two different kinds of purpose. One, which again has been revealed uh, by our research is that people often refer, refer to the um, HR and organization development unit and are saying, no, this is going to be useful, the competency framework to uh, develop our job specification, job role, job description. Whereas um, others are saying, no, no, it's going to be useful to uh, assess their performance. And uh, I do think at the end of the day, it's all of those, unless uh, again, some people want to comment on this. But I do really want to put the question to you, which is what is actually the purpose of developing those uh, individual and organizational competency? Who is supposed to benefit? Um, and you know, is professionalization uh, something that's really is is hiding behind this uh, attempt to to develop or update our competency framework because they've been with us for quite a while. Um, but we have to ask, what's the purpose? And and in that sense, um, you know, it corresponds to what Colofello say, which is it has potential, but it has limitation as well. So anybody want to say what they think, whether they are uh, in OD or HR or other people who are assessing it, et cetera. I can see that Colofello has a, a hand raised, so go for it. Maybe linking up with uh, the, the question of uh, why do we need competency frameworks? Um, I, I think uh, Francine has alluded to that. Uh, we need them because they serve a particular purpose in the broader scheme of things. But um, competency development is not a once-off uh, activity or event. It is something that needs to be sustained because um, Competence and competency 
it, whether we're talking about knowledge or particular demonstrated skills or analytical abilities, whatever competency we are referring to. It is what it is in a particular context. You cannot ignore the context within which somebody is declared competent or incompetent if there is an adequate framework in place. But equally, being considered competent today in this particular domain, in this particular area, does not mean I will be competent tomorrow or in another context. And that is the reason why we say in the current environment, effective leadership or effective uh, or competent leadership, it should be able to renew itself, whether at an individual level or institutional and otherwise. Um, it needs to be extended. When you extend your competence uh, 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 levels, you're not necessarily throwing away that which you brought in yesterday, you're simply expanding on it. But when you do not expand and you do not bring in other new levels of subcompetences or behavioral traits, certain competences become obsolete. It's the same as with technology. Over time, certain things, you know, they don't work. Uh, the, the environment, they don't respond. So the issue of continuous development and treating competency development not as an event, but as a continuous process of renewal uh, is absolutely important. And we should not use the outcomes of yesterday's assessment to predict the future competence of people. At any given point in time, competence gets assessed and judged in real time not in historic terms. And those who are able to sustain it over time, those are the key people that we should be talking to in terms of understanding how they were actually even able to develop themselves that yesterday I was a very good bureaucratic leader and today somebody calls me a democratic or participatory or whatever leader. You need to understand the development journeys uh, uh, of these people. And I think I've sort of like, alluded to, to that a little bit uh, uh, in my study. So maybe the last thing is to say, um, competency frameworks, when things go wrong, we should not pinpoint a singular aspect in an entire ecosystem of an institution. You know, we look at how we need to look at how all the other factors are, are coming together, uh, uh, because it is only when we do that then we are actually able to identify the relevant areas of improvement. And if proper assessments have been done, and it says you need to fix your competency framework, then that is what you do. But it might be that the cause of the challenge is not the competency framework and how it is implemented, but it is something else. It is the system, it is the procedure, and, and, and so forth. So it's always important that before you arrive at a conclusion that says, I need a competency framework, there must have been a very good reason that says, it looks like all else seems to be working. I've got the systems, the money and everything, but I keep hiring the wrong people or I keep promoting the wrong people and all that. Why am I doing that? Then it might be that there's something wrong with your competency assessment. And, and it is not the competency assessment that is written in black and white on a piece of paper. It is how the humans who are implementing what could potentially be a good competency framework that could be creating problems for you. And, and that is why in, 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 in um, maybe in the IGR context or in the governance era, we want to place a lot of emphasis on the human factor. You always have to be very clear whether your problems are not emanating from the human factor, not from your legislations or your frameworks or how you're building and other things. And obviously if the building is wrong, it was again, the human uh, factor that resulted in you finding yourself in that situation. So it is a little bit complex from where I'm sitting. Um, 
and I'm going to agree with Lisiba, and I think in, 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 in my dissertation, I do allude to that and the participants, the SMS competency framework has got its uses, uh, but it does have its uh, limitations. And in the absence of any alternative, we have to continue uh, uh, using it, but we cannot just leave all of the weaknesses years in and years out and we say we don't have an alternative, but how we get to the alternative again, it really needs to be a, a robust process, not a desktop a, 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 a process that is driven by one or two people. And in the end, the people who are expected uh, 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 to live by the standards of that competency uh, 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 framework are taken by surprise as to what uh, uh, is expected of them. So it's a little bit more complex, but in the absence of anything else, I honestly believe that we have to use uh, the SMS competency framework. And if you know its limitations, you will try to cover up with uh, other mechanisms uh, in the process, but you can't go on a covering up process forever and ever. You have to try to address the weaknesses that have already been identified in what is supposed to be a framework that is used across the board. Thank you. Thank you, Colofello. Francine? Okay, I just want to lead you through, because we're getting close to the end of the seminar with the 10 minutes left, to this um, conceptual framework. I don't know, it's, a, it's an academic term, but it's, a, it's really trying to say that um, when we talk about competencies and in the light of what this, um, Colofello has mentioned, we need to be able to see them at different level. And although you might not see properly, um, when we look at the small circle, we're talking about the individual attribute, knowledge, and skills. Then we look at the more, that, that's really what the behavioral um, functional paradigm is. Then we move towards the occupational one, which will then be uh, comprising of more professional and technical specification. Then we move to what uh, Kulafela has mentioned, which is the intra-organizational level, where competency relate to the culture, the climate, the structure of the company, uh, the, the department uh, are all about. Then we move into what the PhD was, which was the inter-organizational level, which is what um, Kulafela's uh, thing is, um, PhD is all about. And then we decided to add um, three different level, and that might uh, also be something that we uh, could talk about. And that is that all those, those individual and organizational um, competency fit into a notion of what kind of state we have. And Stephanie keep on saying, you know, the state is not working very well. Other people have said we have a very hierarchical public administration that is not that different from the pre-1994 days. And then I think Colofello deep down is talking about how can we develop a more efficient state that is becoming eventually a developmental uh, capable state. Sorry, I think Kate is uh, struggling to get the, um, the, 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 the diagram back on. But what we basically are using this for is to say, and many people in the chat are saying, you know, it's important to uh, have competency framework for job specification and recruitment, but you can't just develop job specification within a particular unit of the department without thinking about the organization and the department mandate and structure. So what we try to show in, in this um, diagram that you might uh, remember of is that there are two arrows. The arrows go up that the job specification must be indeed drawn up by the organization development and HR um, um, department unit, but it must also be influenced and shaped by what the organizational mandate, the organization structure is about. And the kind of state that we have will also impact on the kind of competency that um, we're talking about, okay? So there is the, the, the diagram back on. And I think many people will say we're still in this hierarchical, I'm talking about the brown circle now, about this hierarchical public administration. But if our competence have to be um, valued and contextualized into a future capable state, 
we have to change what the job specifications are at the lower level because you need an integration that goes from the bottom up to the top down. Okay, and I think uh, Colofello's um, PhD is very much trying to start from the developmental state to try to say what we need. And that's why she introduced the blue circle, which is the inter-organizational form of leadership. Okay, so uh, when I talk about, so I'm just talking about alignment and trying to say, the uh, competency framework are not just about HR value chain. It's also about HR in the context of a particular state. And if we don't have a good state that is looking for delivery to the public service, then the HR uh, value chain is going to be a bureaucratic exercise without the bigger context, okay? So that's the kind of um, input that we have and that we would like to test with you. And I don't know if you want to comment at this stage. I know Colofello will probably have a lot to say about it, but maybe we could uh, ask other people what they think. And you know, the question that uh, the Kevin and the Nomzi are talking about is how do you get the right people to recruit? My point is it's more about how you get the right people with the right value influenced by the constitution to move towards the development state because we're not yet there according to to us. Over to the audience. Thank you so much, Francine, for that. Uh, very interesting, and it brought together a lot of the discussion. Uh, any comments to Francine's presentation and the kind of bringing together of the conceptual ideas that they're trying to work with? Thanks. Um, Francine, I'm looking at the brown diagram that says a uh, traditional public administration. I think maybe you could put that traditional public administration somewhere between the inter and the intra. But uh, be cautious because um, the South African public service is not just characterized by public administration. Having hierarchy and bureaucracy does not necessarily mean that we are hardcore a traditional public administration in that sense and having rules and, and regulations. There are many elements of new public management in the public service currently. And um, literature from across the world, it says, and that's why I made reference to the notion of organizational hybridity and overlapping uh, 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 models. Um, Traditional public administration, if you were to look at it, and that which worked under traditional administration, which is very good for the management of large organizations. I'm not aware of organizations that have necessarily managed maybe to get rid of it. We might have experiments around the spaghetti organizations and the Silicon Valleys, but it remains one of the core aspects of traditional administration that brings order and sanity in big organizations. Then we have the little aspects of uh, the new public management and uh, the, the, the many new aspects that we are experimenting with of um, the new public governance, the participation, the active involvement of civil society, whether we are doing it right or wrong. Again, oh. these are constructs that are formulated by people to try to make it possible for us to talk about the different periods and the eras and so forth. So I would say your brown thing must come after the intra, but um, soften it up by bringing in the key aspects of a new public management. And I want to believe that in our public administration and public service environment, we have adopted uh, um, quite a number of the key aspects that constitute uh, what is referred to as the new public governance or collaborative uh, public management. But what the balance is, um, I might not be 100% uh, sure of it. And the inter-organizational space then finds itself uh, dealing with organizations that are largely characterized by that, but at an intra-institutional level, the likelihood is we still have a lot of uh, domination by singular leaders. 
and so forth. And those are people who are sitting in particular managerial positions, the levels uh, that uh, you, you're probably trying to, to make reference to. And this is what is now uh, making it impossible, maybe, to go where we want to go because we are not changing the little intra uh, organizational settings that uh, we have been accustomed to for many years. Thank you. Thank you, Chairperson. I just want to check, uh, when you look at Asia and uh, models for competencies, India, Singapore, they are more focusing, and Japan as well, they're more focusing on attitude as opposed to competencies itself. They have the opinion that uh, if the person has got the correct attitude, uh, the high aspects can follow. So I'm not sure uh, here in South Africa we will be at that level or we just have to leave it for now because it's not easy to, to develop an attitude uh, as a competency. That's my understanding. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. For, thank you for that. I saw somebody in the chat also use the example of South Korea and civil servants having to, or public servants actually needing to write exams and different levels of exams to serve at different levels of the public service. So it's interesting to think about. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and you're right. Um, maybe we, we, we have again to, to think about uh, how we analyze our public service and what are the major um, sort of strengths and weaknesses. And that's why somebody was mentioning knowledge as very important because we often define competencies as a, a, an aggregate of skills, attribute, and knowledge. And I think knowledge is very important uh, in the South African case, given where we come from. But to address the issue of um, Colofelo about the brown versus the gray and uh, yellow circle, you're totally right that we, we have, in a way, elements of all the three in our, well, maybe. Some people will say we have a lot of um, public service hierarchy and bureaucracy, which is needed. I think you're co completely right. And that is influencing our intra-organizational intra circle. And we're moving with all those key performance indicators towards the new public management because it is based, and, and I'm joining Yale in that, it's based on uh, evaluating the unit according to performance indicator and result base. Um, so we know we have that and uh, it's in certain pockets. You're right, it doesn't um, go widespread throughout the, the public service. So I mean, I would imagine that those two, the brown and the gray, are part of a, a way to characterize the, the public service as we know it. But I think the big thing is how to get from those two to the, the yellow one, the orange one, the developmental state. And many people in, in Kolofelo's work is saying the big thing will be to change the values of the public service. That they're there to service the public. They're not there to make money. They're not there to use the tenders to enrich themselves. They have to be there because of the uh, reflecting the constitutional values. And the Batupele um, uh, principles have been developed long time ago, but are not really strong enough. Uh, both at the level of leadership and at the level of the bottom. So it's going to take a long time. And I think leadership is important. Recruitment is also important. But to drive this, that will eventually build a much more professional and value-based leadership uh, for public service. Thank, thank you. you so much, Francine. Colleagues, thank you for a very inter in interesting seminar today. And thank you for taking the time this morning to actually join us. It, I, we understand that it is a very busy time of the year and people's diaries are extremely full so we are very grateful for the large number of people that did manage to join us and stay online to our keynote speaker colofello a huge thank you for sharing your work and uh, for a so openly engaging with the real team we look forward to working with you further on this program as we uh, pull out pull the work that real is doing together and Yes. So and 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 I and I think that your work, as you can see today, as well as the work that we're starting and other people, has generated a lot of uh, questions and 
things, important issues that need to be discussed around competencies, competency framework, as well as leadership and management within the public sector. So we hope this is a start of a good working relationship and we hope we're gonna meet many of you along the way.